we are soon going to welcome Margaret Whitehead as well. She's the president of the International Physical Literacy Association, IPLA, and visiting professor at Bedfordshire University. But we, before we talk with, with Margaret, Margaret, we're going to uh, watch this video where IPLA illustrates physical literacy and how to be active for life. So here's that video. It's about first steps and active play. It's about being active with friends and family. It's about recreation and being outdoors. It's about learning and practice. It's about education, making progress and a greater understanding. It's about fitness, challenge, competition and the success it could lead to. It's about expression, performance, imagination and culture. It's about enjoyment every day and for life. This is physical literacy. The motivation, confidence, physical competence, knowledge and understanding to value and take responsibility for engagement in physical activities for life. Physical Literacy. Choosing physical activity for life. Thank you for sharing this uh, video with us. And now let's see if we have Margaret with us. Hi, Margaret. Hi. Hi. So glad to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, my first question to you, you've been working uh, for a lot of years with with uh, physical literacy and, and how to stay active in life. And I wonder where, where does your personal passion and interest in physical literacy come from? Well, um, I think there are three main sources. One is my personal positive experience of physical activity. I mean, I had enormous involvement in a whole variety and opportunities and I think it has made me who I am it's given me my self-confidence and my self-belief so this is a personal view um, secondly the passion came from the confirmation from my philosophical readings of the value of physical activity and the central role of human embodiment for life it, the, the, my philosophy Con confirms the value of our embodied capabilities. We're not a second class profession. We are right there at the heart of everything in our relationship with embodiment. And this is tremendously empowering because for many years of my life, I was a second class citizen. And really our embodiment is now being so highly respected that it it's, makes me even more determined to introduce a wide variety of activities to other people. And the third passion comes from witnessing the growth in self-confidence and self-esteem in participants from um, having really meaningful experiences in physical activity. You can see how they grow, how they, how they develop in, in, in motivation, in confidence, in self-knowledge and self-respect. So for those three reasons, I am passionate to try and get everybody moving throughout life. Thank you so much for that, that answer. Uh, when you now see physical literacy rapidly adapt around the world, do you see any differences between different cultures and, or countries? Or what do you, what do you see? Um, I think that many countries are using the IPLA definition. But inevitably, because the definition has to fit in with the history, the, the culture, the philosophy, there are changes for or slight, slight um, variations. So, for example, the USA and Australia include much more about social, the social domain. Uh, but that's fine. They feel that's important. 
and then New Zealand and India encompass um, aspects of the spirituality from their their first generations, like their Maoris, etc. So there there is um, a recognition that it has to fit in with the the general flow of the philosophy. But I'm less concerned with the fine detail of the definition and more concerned that participants are treated as holistic, unique individuals who are being helped to value physical activity and adopt a physically active lifestyle. If that is what people are concerned about, the whole person concerned about their individual nature and they are working with everybody to promote physical activity for life, I'm less worried about the detail of the definition. If that is their goal, that is excellent. Perfect. Uh, today, the theme has been about the physical environment design. Could you give us an example of a physical literacy enriched environment that you have experienced? Well, I've got two, two, two angles on that. Um, an environmental design would provide um, in bricks and mortar, in, in, in buildings, in, in, in land shapes, etc., would be inviting and welcoming and accessible and offer a variety of opportunities that are um, affordable and available for all to take part in. So it needs to be a welcoming environment. However, if you look at um, the other side of a physical literacy enriched environment, this to me really resonates with the ambience of the session, the session which is supportive, celebratory, um, the individual is known. So the, the the emotional environment, the affect environment is just as important as the physical environment. And if we can address both, then we have the real possibility of, of making a difference. So I've, I've split it between the physical opportunities, um, which could simply be a, a trim trail through the forest, or it could be the uh, local government providing swimming pools or, or ski tracks or ski jumps or whatever. So it, it, it could be it could be a variety of things. So in a nutshell, I would, I would look at those two sides, the physical environment and also the affective environment. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, now I have a question for, from one of Sweden's most experienced PE teacher, and he's also PE teacher educationer. Uh, his, uh, his name is Åke Wittfeldt, and I think you actually met him at uh, New Zealand at the Congress in 2014. Mm -hmm. And he's wondering, if you work in school with PE, my experience is that if you do it in a holistic way and look at the individual pro pro progress, it's frustrating when you have to evaluate your pupils by a grade at the end of the semester. To assess the children in that way is very normative. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Well, I identify completely with... Um, the concern of, of, of your colleague. Um, I think it's very sad that we have to toe the line to function like other subjects. Um, I don't see, this has been mentioned, I think, by, your, by other speakers, um, I don't see physical literacy being related to any norms. It's a, a personal journey that people are involved in, and comparisons are irrelevant. If we are charting progress, if we are looking at assessment, then this has to be ipsative. It's really starting from where that particular individual is. So I think it's very sad that we have any benchmarks which will say you are failing, you are winning. I don't want it to be like that. This is, this is why there's so little physical activity in, in the elder, elder community. They have learned that they're not good, that they're not as good as A, B and C, therefore they're not good. And we really need to turn this around so that they celebrate their, their progress in whatever way that is. Um, in IPLA, in, in the second book, Physical History Across the World, we have um, suggested a matrix. And we recommend that this is a self-report um, exercise so that the actual participant grades themselves on their motivation, their competence, etc and then uses that information in a reflective way so that both the practitioner and the participant are involved in um, making some judgment about where they are and where they need to go next. 
So it's some form of judgment assessment for learning so that this is this is a marker for where they are themselves and having achieved this much then you you can go on to, to achieve something else um i i think it's very sad that um such an important aspect of education is is marred by failure i think there's too much in education which is succeeding and failing and competing what we're really after is every individual blossoming in their own way, whether they've got a special need or they're, they're, they're outstanding. I think it's very sad. And I think we should take the lead in education to say, we're not going to have schooling to, to identify that the failures. We need to have schooling which I, which, in which every individual is a winner in every subject. Every individual is a, is a winner. That's, that's a great saying. Uh, I also have a question from uh, Grim Jern Ud, who is a PL master trainer at Change the Game. And he's asking, at your talk the first day of the conference, you were clearly explained the you clearly explained the phys, phys, philosoph, philosophical <laughs> underpinnings of physical literacy. Yes, yes. <laughs> Could you please tell us how the philosophical underpinnings of P PL can guide practitioners uh, in different system levels? Yes, well, this is very simple. This is a simple situation that I learned from reading philosophy. I learned a lot about monism and holism, and that we should be treating each individual as a whole, not just a body or a mind uh, or a machine. They are intrinsically all interconnected. And it's not a body mind split. But we need to treat people that, knowing that they have feelings, they have competences, they have knowledge as a whole. Existentialism argues that we make ourselves by the interactions we have, and therefore we want to make the interactions as rich and as varied as possible. So this is what existentialism does. It says it needs to be um, a, a experiences that are meaningful, and are varied and are rich, but not in a smorgasbord of, of an hour of this and an hour of that, an hour of the other. It has to be measured um, breadth in that they have enough time within a particular activity to get on top of it, to get inside it, to have some, some feeling of, of, of playing part or playing a part or making a contribution. So taste of courses, I would very much um, uh, discourage but I think we have got to um, find ways of spending time in a variety of different contexts, but enough time to feel that we are, um, we have found part of ourselves, we have realized our potential. So that's um, existentialism. So first of all, we're a whole, never mind about what you call it or all the language, but we are a whole, that's monism. Secondly, we make ourselves so the more we interact with, the richer we are, and the more we um, alert and develop our potentials. And finally, phenomenology reminds us that we are individual. That the experiences that we have color our perception and color our action. And we have to be very careful because the experience that I have today is going to live with me and, and, and influence how I read a situation, how I react in a situation. I say to my students very often, take care of the present because it soon becomes the past and has huge influence on the future. Children will learn that they are not good, etc., etc., and they'll take that with them. If they learn that it's rewarding, it's really um, self-revealing, self etc., if it develops self-confidence, they want to have more. They'll come and have more if that's the experience. So phenomenology says we're all different. And if we have positive experiences, we shall take those with us, and that will um, encourage us to continue to take part. So those are the, the straightforward ways. Monism, not complicated, but we are a whole. Existentialism, we make ourselves, so let's put us in the situations. And phenomenology is we, 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 we bring our previous perceptions with us as we, as we read the new situation, and therefore, we want to have positive experiences to build on. 
That is all that I think I need people to understand about the philosophy. It's very, very powerful, very strong and very persuasive. It's not there to trip you up. It's there to give you the confidence that what you're doing is making a tremendous contribution. Thank you so, so much, Margaret. I think that's uh, the end for this Q&A. Thank you so much for, for sharing with us and being with us. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other once again. Thank you very much indeed. I've thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you.